Hi, my name is Peter Chin Hong from Infectious Diseases, and today I'm here to tell you about the wonderful world of helmets. Uh, you know this slide very well from the class, but uh, we're going to talk about helmets today, and we'll focus in on the three main classes, which are flukes, tapeworms, and roundworms. But first, I thought it would be fun to start off with some of the famous worms you might know from fiction and movies. But so the ones, the one on your left is Flubberworm from Harry Potter. Some of you may know that one. And of course, the one from on the right is Space Slug from the Star Wars series, particularly The Empire Strikes Back. So today, uh, so this is the outline of the two videos, actually. But in this video, we're going to focus in on the introduction to helmets and Ron Worms. Let's start with the introduction to helmets. So what are helminths? Helminths are multicellular organisms, in contrast to protozoa, which you've also heard about in this class, which are single cellular organisms. They are macroscopic, uh, so you can see many of them, although some of them in many of their stages are microscopic as well. They infect nu numerous species, other mammals, uh, other animals, as well as humans. And depending on the species that affects you, it may complete its life cycle in the human or not. And that relates to what kind of disease process it, it, you can see as a clinician. Humans can be primary, uh, primarily infected or dead end hosts, and we'll discuss that as we go along in this talk. Helmets are a huge problem, and 1.5 billion humans are thought to be infected, uh, with some parasites being more important than others. But the main point is that most of you are asymptomatic when you have a helmet infection. There are many people walk around with worms, they don't know it. And unless you're immunocompromised or the worms get to a particular burden, you may not even recognize that you have uh, an infection with a helmet. And we'll discuss some of these scenarios with you as we move along with some of the cases. How are helmets transmitted? Uh, they are transmitted primarily in an oral fecal uh, manner where you ingest contaminated uh, food or water but they can also be uh, infected uh, through the skin, open skin, being barefoot, swimming in Lake Victoria, for example, or vectors, particularly mosquitoes in filariasis. Let's give you an example. There's a pork tapeworm, which is associated mainly with infection in pigs. It's called tinea solium, and it looks like that. It's very easy to see microscopically. It's one of the largest uh, helminths or parasites that we have. And depending on the kind of parasite and the kind of form you ingest, in this case, eggs, if you ingest the eggs, the eggs hatch and the micro larvae move into the bloodstream to different parts of the body, in this case, the brain. Uh, they cause these lesions called, uh, which are in, uh, in the cyst form and the inflammatory process to these lesions is what causes the disease and the patient may present with seizures, for example. So how are helminths different from bacteria and human cells? Actually, you can see from this slide that helminths are very similar to human cells. Um, they're macroscopic. A lot of times, humans are microscopic. Helminths are microscopic. Um, they have a nucleus. Uh, there's no cell wall in contrast to bacteria, where there's a peptidoglycan cell wall. And the cell membrane in helminths and humans are very similar as well. So as you can see from the slide, helminths are very similar to humans. What is the immunologic response to helminths when we get infected? Well, the IgE guides the eosinophils to uh, attack the helminths when we become infected. And the eosinophils release all of these toxins that they contain in, in, in their granules. And there's T cell release of IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And this inflammatory response is really what causes a lot of disease and symptoms uh, when we get infected with these parasites. The eosinophilia, uh, in particular, is nonspecific, unfortunately, and can be caused by a variety of, of diseases, allergic diseases, autoimmune diseases, and neoplasia or cancer. But when you do see eosinophilia in a patient who you suspect might have a parasitic infection, it can be quite helpful, particularly in eosinophilia above 20%. So how do we organize this whole area of these vast number of parasites? Well, I first of all think of them morphologically. So we talked about dividing them up into the way they look like, roundworms, flukes, and tapeworms. But we can also divide them up into whether or not they cause disease limited to the GI system, 
or whether or not they cause systemic disease. And we'll talk about certain organisms like strongyloides where it's really outside of the GI system where most of the disease that's bad occurs. On a more granular level, how should you organize your information when you're going through the section? Like with many other sections uh, we've talked about, uh, one way to think about organizing parasites is thinking about the epidemiology, how it's transmitted, the pathogenesis, you know, how it causes disease, some of the clinical manifestations. We'll really not emphasize treatment as much in this section, but there are some general rules we might mention. And particularly prevention is something we always think about. Most of these parasites are prevented by just regular hand hygiene and clean water. Let's start off with roundworms. The other name for roundworms is nematodes, um, but I always find it more important or interesting to think about them as roundworms just because the name uh, is similar to the way they look like, which is like an earthworm essentially. So there are a vast number of roundworms that we'll talk about in this section. So let's start off with a case, a very typical case that you might see in the United States. A six-year-old boy noticed to be constantly scratching his perianal area. He says that the other kids at school have been scratching their butts too. And here you see a picture of the kids scratching his butt. You know, I see lots of kids scratching their butts. And every time I see that, I always think about whether or not they might have this particular parasite. I'm probably the only person thinking that in the audience, but, you know, that's what comes with the territory. So this is a pinworm or enterobius. Uh, how do you get it? Well, you ingest uh, this via, via eggs uh, through the mouth. It goes to the gut. The eggs hatch into adults. Uh, the adults uh, mate and lay eggs. Uh, there's an incubation of one to two months during this, while this process occurs. It ma mainly occurs in children, and it's mainly manifested by perianal itching. How do you diagnose it? You diagnose it by a scotch tape test. Essentially what happens is at night, the female comes out in the perianal area, releases thousands of eggs. And if you put a piece of tape next to the kid's butt, uh, in the morning time, you can uh, pretty much capture many of these parasites on the scotch tape. And that's essentially how this diagnosis is made in most parts of the world. So what are my pearls in this section? Well, the intense uh, anal scratching caused by pinworm may result in bacterial superinfection or cellulitis. So if somebody comes in with buttock cellulitis, particularly in a child who's itching a lot, think about pinworm as the underlying cause and not the bacterial superinfection that you will treat with antibiotics. Pinworm is the most common helminth in the United States. So one of you may see this for sure in, the, in your careers here. Let's move on to the next parasite. Uh, a typical case is a 27-year-old female presenting to clinic with earthworms in her stool. These are probably uh, the most classic case of roundworms. These are, um, you know, what we call um, ascaris. Uh, it, it often reminds me of Bucatini because it kind of looks kind of like the right thickness and it kind of like, uh, you know, with tomato sauce or not, depending on whether or not there's blood or not. It kind of sounds kind of morbid, but, uh, you know, in, the, in this part of the course, you can take any memory aids and, and take it because, you know, it's kind of a challenging uh, place to learn all these parasites. So this is Ascaris. Like I said, uh, you ingest eggs through the mouth, contaminated drink or food. It goes into the gut. And what happens here is, in contrast to pinworm, uh, these organisms leave the gut. These larvae go across the mucosal uh, membrane of the gut and into the bloodstream and from the bloodstream and goes straight to the lungs. And many of these parasites love the lungs and Ascaris is no exception. So it goes into the alveolar, into, in the lungs, it gets up to the bronchial tree, and then goes up to the trachea and then you swallow it. And then when you swallow these larvae in the gut, they mature into adult worms, they mate, they release eggs, you release the eggs through the gut, uh, and then the cycle continues. Ascaris is seen mainly in tropical region, regions, not so much in the United States. Um, and here is the life cycle. Uh, and you'd see many of these kind of CDC transmission cycles. Uh, they can be kind of confusing sometimes, but essentially you take it in, you take in the uh, eggs through the mouth, through contaminated food or drink. Uh, it goes into the gut. Uh, the larvae uh, hatch out of the eggs, they go across the membrane, they love the lungs, 
they go up the trachea, you swallow it into your gut, and then the cycle continues. How is this uh, manifested clinically? Well, it's mainly, uh, the main problems are in the pulmonary symptoms, a uh, syndrome called Loeffler syndrome, where you can get a constellation of dry cough, malaise, uh, eosinophilia, both uh, through BAL diagnosis as well as a peripheral eosinophilia. And if you have a high burden of worms in the intestines, this, they can actually cause an obstruction. And you can get a GI obstruction uh, syndrome with a lot of ascaris uh, in, in, in the GI system. But most people are actually asymptomatic like we discussed uh, earlier in this talk. How do you diagnose it? Uh, well, you can diagnose it either by symptoms, but very few people have these symptoms, either pulmonary or the intestinal obstruction. Most people uh, diagnose this through uh, uh, OMPs on the stool sample. Uh, you can certainly pass a worm, and that's what happened in this particular case, but you can also find uh, eggs uh, of the organism in the stool sample. So what's my pearl in this section? Well, the major damage of ascaris occurs not from the presence of the worms in the gut, although some people might have obstruction, but rather from the migration of the larvae itself, where the larvae are trans transporting themselves from the gut to the lungs. And that process uh, causes a lot of inflammation and causes the syndrome that we call Loeffler syndrome in the lungs. So the one pearl is that uh, you see peripheral infiltrates in Loeffler syndrome, which is kind of the reverse of pulmonary edema, where they're more sort of central and peripheral rather than peripheral infiltrates. Also, the infiltrates are, could be transient as the worm is migrating through the lungs. So that's the end of the first part of our talk about roundworms. There are a lot more to cover, so come back soon.